All right. If you got a Bible, and I hope that you do, go ahead and grab it. And we're going to be in the first book of the Bible, the book known as the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 25. Um, Genesis 25. In the, in the world of which I am sort of a part, the Christian evangelical, what's known as the Reformed world, if you're not familiar with it, that's fine. It doesn't ultimately matter that much, um, the titles and things of that nature. But the world in which I'm a part, um, there is a, I believe at times, oftentimes, an espousal, a statement among Christians, among pastors, among people who prize theology and the person and work of God. There's a statement that all of Scripture is breathed out by God. All of Scripture is breathed out by God, which is a biblical statement. And that all of Scripture is profitable to us. And yet, practically speaking, what we mean by that statement is the New Testament. That all of Scripture is breathed out by God, but really the New Testament is breathed out. And all of Scripture is supposedly practical and uh, we can make observations from it. It's profitable to us. But really, it's the New Testament. It's the gospel accounts of Jesus, which we've just spent the last month and a half in. And it's the New Testament epistles of Paul and James and Peter and John. And one of the things, I kind of grew up in conservative evangelicalism, very conservative evangelicalism. And other than hearing some cute stories about a young shepherd boy and a, a mammoth giant, or this really cute story about God flooding the whole world and destroying everyone, or, you know, stories like that, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time unpacking the, whole t- the Old Testament together. And I believe both my upbringing and how we treat it in Christianity, oftentimes, that that is a colossal travesty. I think there is a ton to be learned from the Old Testament. And so for the next seven weeks, we're going to be in the book of Genesis. And if you've been with me, heard my preaching for years, you know, we've explored the story of Joseph. We've done the story of Abraham. Wedged in the middle is the story of the deceiver. And I'm not talking about Satan. I'm talking about a dude who's going to look a lot like you and I, okay? So Genesis chapter 25, we arrive upon the scene here. Abraham, the first patriarch, the father of what will become the nation of Israel, the one who received the covenant and promises in Genesis chapter 12 and 15, has just passed away. His shady son, Isaac, is now leading the family. And Isaac's equally shady wife, Rebecca. And so we're just gonna kind of pick up on the story, dive right into the narrative this morning. We'll read and we'll make observations as we go. This is history. This actually took place 4,000 years ago. So we ready for a 4,000 year old story? Yes, good. We're not a responsive church. You don't have to respond. All right, um, but, uh, but it's cool that you do. Genesis chapter 25, here we go, verse 19. These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac is Abraham's only legitimate son. People will ask me, they'll be like, what is going on in the Middle East? What has been going on in the Middle East? What what will go on in the Middle East? And I always just say, basically, it's a polarizing kind of global family feud that's been going on for 4,000 years. Abraham decided he wanted to be impatient. Sarah condoned this. He went and slept with Hagar. Ishmael was born, illegitimate son. And then God blessed in old age and brought about Isaac. And the descendants of Isaac hated the descendants of Ishmael and vice versa. And so that's what's going on here. This is the only legitimate son, though, of Abraham, Isaac. And Isaac, for some reason, and the only thing that we can kind of ascertain is that the reason why Isaac was not married until he was 40 years old is because they were surrounded by the Canaanite people. And God had said, do not marry the inhabitants of Canaan. Do not marry the Canaanite people. And so at 40 years of age, Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for Isaac. And he finds a young lady named Rebecca who the dowry paid, as you know, if you've read the book of Genesis, is an earring and two bracelets for her. And Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife, Rebecca, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padamaram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And Yahweh was receptive to his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. Pause for a second. When we read these things, it's important for Bible study. We read these things in the Old and the New Testament, particularly in the Old Testament. Statements like this, that someone was barren. In antiquity, a barren woman was seen as cursed by Yahweh. And so here's Isaac at the age of 40. 
and he prays for his wife who cannot conceive, and God hears and answers. And what will happen, stupidly at times, is we will take a story like that, and we will apply it as principle in our lives. This is descriptive material. It's not prescriptive for us. That does not mean we shouldn't pray about things and we shouldn't ask the Lord to intervene. But also we shouldn't be disappointed when he doesn't act just because he did it for one. Rebecca doesn't mean in any of our life circumstances, any of our anguish that he will answer in this way. So it's describing events that took place for these individuals. So she conceived. But the children, we're going to find out, there's twins here, inside her struggled with each other. They could have been best friends who still fought sometimes, they're brothers after all, but instead they were mortal enemies. And she said to the Lord, why is this happening to me? You been there? Like, you know, why, why God, this should not be happening to me. I'm a good girl. So she went to inquire the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, Edom, and Israel, two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, this is all kind of mind-blowing information. She has been praying for babies. She is now pregnant, and she feels such a turmoil going on, more so, I guess, than morning sickness, to the point where she's like, there is something up. They're, they're fighting, they're, they're going to combat, they're bo- building their little forts and they're shooting their BB guns at each other inside of my belly and I need to know, God, what is going on here? Like, what's happening? And the Lord says, um, hey, here's what's happening. This is what I decree. There's gonna be two nations emerge from these two boys. The Edomites will come who hate me and the Israelites will come who I love and will sometimes serve me and sometimes be rascals. And the older of the two boys in your womb, by mere minutes, will serve the younger. So the younger will take preeminence. It doesn't tell us this, but I would imagine this doesn't bring a lot of comfort to the nauseated Rebecca at this point. When her time came to give birth, verse 24, there were indeed, like God said, twins in her womb, Now, this is like where history is more humorous than fiction. Because the description, they're very opposite, these two little boys. The first one came out red looking. Now, and that that does not mean that he was splotchy. It meant that he was a ginger. He was covered in ginger hair. He was like a ginger Ewok from the womb. Like he's got hair everywhere. It says literally covered with hair like a fur coat. Like, I just love that. Like, Rebecca's like, man, there's all this turmoil going on. God's like, hey, there's going to keep being turmoil for forever. And then Rebecca's like, all right, get these babies out of me. And the first one comes out with like bearded baby with a sweater vest built in. Like, like that. And you're just like, what is going on here? All right. And uh, as he pops out, emerges from the womb, this like tiny little Sasquatch. Um, after this, his brother came out. So what do they name him? Like, what do they name the firstborn? The little Ewok. They name him Harry. They name him actually, it's like Ginger Harry. That's what Esau means. That's what Edom means. It means red and covered in hair. No imagination for Isaac and Rebecca. She's just exhausted at this point. Isaac is exhausted. And so it's like, hey, let's just name him what he looks like. And then they decide to refuse to expand their imagination when his little brother, smooth little baby Jacob is born. It says this, after this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand, trying to pull him back in. I will be first. He doesn't know the prophecy yet. And a heel grasper was a term of derision that was used in antiquity. It meant somebody who was cunning, a charlatan, a deceiver. Someone who was conniving was really the word there. And so they decide to name the first baby, Ginger Harry, and the second baby, Conniver, heel grabber, literally. So he was named Jacob. I apologize for any of you named Jacob here. I'm sorry, your name, they've tried to, they've tried to change it in the last like 100 years and be like, oh, Jacob means whatever it means. Jacob, what does it mean? 
Do we know? We don't even know. He doesn't know because he's full of deceit. Um, and so, and no, but uh, no, but, but they, they're tra- we tried to change it. Now, Jacob was like one of the most popular names ever, and it literally means conniving or deceiver. It's just hilarious. Anyway, um, so that's the two boys. This is history for us. That's the two boys that are born to Isaac. And we're like, at this point, if you're tracking, you're going, God, this is the hope for your nation? You got this hairy little mongrel over here who's going to serve smooth, deceitful, conniving Jacob. All right. Now we emerge upon the text really for our study this morning. Verse number 27. When the boys grew up, and most scholars, especially rabbinical scholars, believe that the events that transpire here at the end of Genesis chapter 25 are right on the heels of Abraham's death. You would actually, it was very common, and it still is to this day, 4,000 years later, to concoct or to brew a lentil stew as a form of contrition or as a form of mourning the passing of someone else. It was, it was seen as a mourner's stew. So that's probably what's going on here in the text is that the death of Abraham, the patriarch of the family, that would mean the boys are around 15 to 16 years old at this point. Remember, a Jewish boy comes of age at age 12. So they are men, they are young men. When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter an outdoorsman. Now we pause here for a second because when we read this, right away some of us resonate. Like some of us who love going out hunting and trapping and I'm not in that camp, but I love eating whatever you guys kill. Uh, I used to have a hunter friend who would always go out deer hunting and kill a bunch of venison and bring it back to us. And I loved him so much. Uh, I need him replaced in my life. So, um, but there's, there's the, you know, there's this hunter mentality where we imagine him as the guy who's wearing a bandana and the cut off sleeves and he's got his whole arsenal at home and he's got a bunker dug in his backyard. Like that's kind of Esau for us. Um, but when we hear the word, this is, this is what's important about Bible study. When you hear the word hunter in the book of Genesis, this is not a compliment. It would trace every single person's mind back to the original hunter, Nimrod. It would trace every person's mind back in the book of Genesis to the reality that hunting and killing and death was never supposed to be part of the equation. That this is the result of living in a fallen and broken world. Nimrod was this mighty hunter that scripture records for us, hated God. And so Esau, when it says here, he was a hunter and he's a man of the field. We get this kind of this mindset. I mean, if he was hairy coming out, like I cannot even imagine at this point in time at 15 or 16, what he looks like, but here's this kind of barbarian of sorts. And yet the the posture of his heart is, and we're going to see this, is one of anger and hatred and rage and hostility toward God and toward his covenants. So that's Esau. Esau became an expert hunter and outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. So the picture that we've often probably heard if you study this passage or thought of or that I portrayed is that Esau is this hunter covered in hair. We don't even know if he wore clothes because he had built-in hair. Like he had built-in clothes. Like he just, you know, he's just this guy, this savage, this barbarian. And then Jacob, for Christmas, he's getting like his easy bake oven and his little apron. He's like baking his goodies, you know. And he's like, Mom, I'm ready. And um, you know, like that's that's Jacob. It smooth. Okay. Now quiet here doesn't necessarily mean that. Maybe he was that way. But quiet uh, oftentimes in scripture means somebody who's devout, someone who's committed. And what we understand is by him dwelling in the tents. He was, yes, clearly deceptive. Yes, maybe a little bit of a mama's boy, but he was also devoted to his family, or at least to his mom, to the ways of the patriarchs, to the significance, as we'll see, of his birthright or of the birthrights, okay? And the promises that God had made to his grandfather Abraham. So, it says this, Isaac, verse 28, Loved Esau because, why? He had a taste for wild game. It's a good enough reason to love a son. He had a taste for wild game. But Jacob was loved by Rebekah. So some issues there that we'll address. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted. Now, if you've not read this story, 
there's a little twist here, there's a little surprise that if we're not familiar with Jewish culture, we'll miss. But he comes in and he's exhausted. He's been hunting, foraging. And he said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff. Everything about Esau is animalistic, including his dialogue, his vocabulary. He's like, give me some of that red stuff. And because I'm exhausted, that's also why people called him Edom. Now, here's what's somewhat significant. Jacob's name means deceiver, hill grabber, conniving. He's brewing a lentil stew. And if you don't know anything about lentil stew, just like it was a disappointment to Esau, it would be a disappointment to most of us. Because it looks red. It says it's red, which would have denoted that when Esau saw it, he thought it was filled with meat, which every stew should be, all right? As God-fearing people, right? No, but he's, uh, he's like, it, it should be filled with meat. He thinks it's filled with meat, but lentil stew, the beans when they're crushed, they emit this red color, at least some of them do. So Jacob knows exactly what he's doing. This, uh, many commentators agree that this is why Esau later on in Genesis accuses Jacob of deception. You knew what you were doing. I thought I was about to chow down on some chunky beef stew and I got bean soup. Like that's, that's literally what's happening here. And so Jacob says, give me some of that red stuff, that, that broth that is filled with the good stuff, filled with meat. And Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Now, as we're going to see in the coming weeks, there is somewhat of a difference between the blessing of a patriarch or a father upon his son and the birthright. But the birthright carried with it economic stability. Yes, there was the added pressure of providing for the family, but that was much easier done if you received the birthright. How it would work in Jewish culture was if you had 12 sons, all of the second through 12 sons would receive an equal portion and the firstborn would receive a double portion. So the firstborn son would receive his part of the 12 and then a second part. So you would divide the blessing or the birthright into 13 parts if you had 12 sons. Well, this was especially important. Most of the time in that day, you'd have eight or nine or 10 children, but this was especially important when you only had two children. So Esau has a right here by coming out a couple minutes before Jacob, even though Jacob was grabbing hold of the hill, Esau has rights to the birthright, to two thirds of the estates. And Abraham, and therefore Isaac, were wealthy, wealthy men, some of the most wealthy men of their time. But there was a added significance, and we know this, we've already touched on it. There was an added significance to the birthright in this particular family. It was not just monetary, it was not just economic, it was not just positional, it was also supremely spiritual. That this is the family through which a redeemer will come by which all nations of the earth will be blessed. And so Esau, we're gonna find out, cares very little for his birthright. And Jacob, for most honest, if we're honest, most likely reasons, cares for it supremely for all the wrong reasons. So he says, I'll tell you what, I will give you a pot of this red stuff in exchange for your birthright. Look, said Esau, verse 32, I'm about to die. And my kids say that every time, like they haven't had a meal in like 90 minutes. So we don't know here if this is hyperbolic or if Esau's being legitimate or not. He has been out in the field. I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, you better swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew. There is the bait and switch. The red stuff turns out to be bean soup to Esau and he ate, drank, got up and went away. So Esau despised or counted it as insignificant or nothing, his birthright. End of story. And you're like, all right. You know, all God's people at this point are going, I have no idea what the heck is going on. Like, why are we here? Why is this here? Um, this past week, I went over to Tampa and I was visiting my friend Nick, who's a tattoo artist, and we were hanging out. And I, he's moved into a new place and across the way is his buddy, Adam. And Adam's not a believer. And so we get into all this like really, really cool discussion theologically and about design and about morality and the problem of evil in the world. And it was just an awesome conversation for several hours. But over the course of the conversation, Nick, my friend, who's recently become a Christian, uh, told Adam and, and me that he has another tattoo friend 
who is an ardent conspiracy theorist. I know we got a few of you guys in this, in this church. Uh, ardent conspiracy theorist. And that one of the things that he is just adamant about is that the Civil War never happened. Okay? Yeah. You're not interested. I wasn't either. We're talking about something that that supposedly took place 150 years ago. And so the Civil War, this colossal epic stroll between the North and the South. And then Nick went on to say, the reason his tattoo friend, tattoo artist friend, does not believe the Civil War took place is because there's no actual photographs of the Civil War, he argues. They're all paintings. So I'm just sitting there and I'm going, this guy's an idiot. (laughs) First of all, that, that would mean that nothing that took place before photography was invented actually took place, or at least it couldn't be substantiated. But Nick ultimately said what I was thinking. He goes, I just sat there and told him, what does it matter? Like, who cares? Now, I think it matters, and that's for another time and place. But like, who cares if like the Civil War took place and all this stuff? Who cares if it didn't? Who cares if it's a hoax? Who cares if it's propaganda? It doesn't matter. The point is, as we read Genesis chapter 25, the birth of Esau and Jacob, and then this betrayal, this little family feud that goes on where Jacob's like, hey, um, in exchange for some of this stew that you think is, is meat laden stew, give me your birthright. And at the end of it, we read it and we're like, okay, it's kind of a cool story. For some of us, it's like not even a cool story. We're just like, whatever, it's brothers being brothers. What's the point? Why is it here? As we established in the last six months, our mantra again and again and again that I've told you guys is this, that we want, we long to be a movement for all people to understand and experience the radical grace of Jesus Christ. So we're here. And when we come to Genesis 25, I think if we are careful and diligent, we see clearly on display in the lives, in the shady business of Esau and Jacob and Isaac and Rebekah, the radical grace of Jesus Christ. So I just want us to see it and I want us to be moved by it again. So how do we see it? Really, there's just two points this morning. There's two points. Uh, the one is what I would call shady guilt. That's, that's, the, first, that's the first point, okay? Um, when I thought about Jacob, and I thought about this story, and I thought about the shadiness of his guilt and sin, my mind went back to a story that some of you have heard. I probably told it a year, year and a half ago. In my former church, we had a Thursday night service. Some of you came to that. And... Um, on occasion, I would take Spurgeon and Evie, my two oldest, with me to church. I would come home after school. I'd pick them up. I would take them to church for the evening, and they would hang out, and they would play, and then they would be in class for the service. And so on one particular Thursday, I did this. Now, you guys know if you've been tracking with me, if you've been in child care, um, literally the uh, Renee and Brandon, I was uh, by their house yesterday, and Brandon's like, hey, your son Spurgeon is so well-behaved. And I'm like, yeah, I'm never dropping Evie off. Like my, my second child, it's not that she's not well-behaved. She's just a wild child. Like she's just a wild child. Like she's just like wants to do what she wants to do. I don't know where she gets that from. And so she just, uh, you know, is filled with her own cunning devices. And so you got Spurgeon who's pretty docile and Evie and they, I bring them to church and Evie's always trying to get into mischief. Well, service kind of commences. We go through band practice and we go through service and after service, Spurgeon comes up to me and he's all upset. I've told you guys this, you know right away when a ginger gets upset, they get splotchy. And so I'm like, well, what's going on, bro? And he just goes, Evie was punching us the whole time in class and I would not obey the teacher. And I'm like, all right, Evie, come here. So I sit her down, I'm like, hey, did this happen? She's like, no. And then I asked the teacher and she's like, well, it's sort of, but you know. And, uh, and so then we get in the car and I'm on my way home and I'm just exasperated because this has been going on. And I'm like, you know what, Evie, you're not gonna be able to come to church with me on Thursday nights anymore. I'm really, you're gonna come on Sunday so you should to pray soul needs it, but you can't come on Thursday nights anymore. And, uh, and she's like, please, please, I'll never do it again. And we get home and we go upstairs and she's in this state of contrition and I'm brushing their teeth, getting them ready for bed. And this person says something and she hauls off and just whacks him. 
And so I'm like, that does it. Get in your room right now. I'm going to finish up here with Spurgeon. Then I'm going to come deal with you. And so I, I brush his teeth and she goes into her room. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It would never happen again. And I send him off to bed and I round the corner from the bathroom into her room. And I know it's light in here. And so you can't really see it very well. But this is literally, I had to take a picture. This is the picture that I see. Okay. You guys might remember it of Evie. And when I first shared this, and since that point in time when I've ever shared this, most people say, oh, that's so cute. You guys are wise to the situation. Because you guys know that there is zero contrition going on right there. That is a heart of deceptive manipulation. That's a little girl who says, if daddy sees me like this, he will not possibly be able to give me discipline. And I didn't, okay? As I saw this and I knew exactly what was going on. Like there was, there was no like godly humility of confession there. I would argue that most of the time, part of me would argue all the time, there are shades and slivers of manipulative deception and even our best confession. This is why John Bunyan would say, the Puritan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he said, the best prayer I ever prayed had enough sin in it to damn the whole world. And some of you can resonate with that. The best prayer, the best confession, con confession, the best service I have ever done still had enough in this broken place with a soul that is still broken, even though it's been redeemed. As Luther would say, simultaneously justified but sinful has enough transgression in it to damn the entire world. Okay? And that's what we see here in the story. It's not just my little girl. It's not just us. It's been like this. This is the plight of human history. This is the shady business of sin that we try to look a certain way. So uh, it doesn't even start with Jacob. It doesn't even start with Esau. It starts with Isaac. So you have Isaac. And it really starts before Isaac. It starts with Abraham, who's called out as a pagan, a Zoroastrian, a worshiper of the stars, to be a worshiper of Yahweh by radical grace. But yet we see that Abraham is a violent man, an infuriated man, a deceptive man. We see him descend to Egypt. You probably know the story. And apparently Sarah, you know, at, in her 80s, was still extremely desirable. And so Pharaoh was like, whoa, look at Sarah. And so um, Abraham said, oh, you know what? If he finds out that we're married, he's going to kill me. And so I'll just pretend like she's my sister. So shady, so weird, so jacked up. And then what happens with Isaac? He does the same thing with Rebecca. It's like, you know, oh my gosh, like this ruler loves Rebecca. He thinks she's cute. Like, what am I going to do? I'm just going to pretend like. So we see this, this deception from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Not only do we see deception, we see favoritism. Obviously, Abraham favored Isaac, which there is something wrong with that. Even though Ishmael was not the son of promise. There's something wrong there. There's something broken. There's something off. And then what do we see? We see in the text, Jacob is revered by his mom, the favorite, and Esau is the favorite of his dad. And what do we see carry on from there with the deceiver, with Jacob? He has a couple of favorites. And he's deceitful, which basically just tells us the reality that we all know the sin that we are susceptible to and that we engage in is not isolated to you. It spans out. It infiltrates others. And we are catechizing our kids. Grace is important, but it's also important for us to like learn what is right and how to live and how to combat this and how the war between the flesh and the spirit take place and what it means to submit to the sweet freedom of grace. So you got Isaac and you got Rebecca deceitful themselves. We're about to see Rebecca's deceit in the coming weeks here before her ancient husband. Favoritism. And then you got Esau. We've already talked about this, but Esau was a man of fury. And actually, this is very interesting to me. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about Esau. I think it's verse 16. And it says, don't be like that atrocious, that wicked, that deplorable man Esau. And at that point, you're expecting now the indictment to read something like, because he, you know, smoked and swore and chewed and hung out with girls to do. You know, you're expecting something like that. You're expecting just something terrible. Like he was a murderer and he was a rapist. And he, you know, and all it said is who, because he was hungry, gave up his birthright. 
Well, how many of us have done this? Like how many of us, I mean, like, I'll just pick on the Christians here, myself included among them, jacked up and shady as we still are. Like, how many of us have despised the birthright of grace given to us and it changed it practically day in and day out for what will temporarily, we think, satisfy our desires? And so like, like hey, here, here's, here is in front of me, what would we all say? Like if we're Christians here today, what would we all say? If you're not a Christian, you know what Christians are supposed to say, right? Sometimes you're better at it than us Christians are. Well, Jesus is supposed to be most important. The kingdom is supposed to be most important. And when we struggle and we wrestle and I did all that, and that is the concept of God's radical mercy displayed toward us is that even in our sin and our struggles, after we are just, after we trust in him, he still cleanses us and picks us up. But yet that's supposed to be what's most important. And we will confess almost hypocritically at times that that is what's most important. And yet the reality for our beleaguered souls is that that's very rarely what's most important. It's all of this. And some of us are like, I've heard people be like, well, it's really hard when you have a family. Let's just be real. Our family's not our highest priority a lot of times either. Even the good things are not our highest priority. It's a sports team that's never gonna know your name. It's, it's a new bag that's going to be dusty and forgotten in eight months. But that's our highest priority a lot of times. That, that becomes my highest priority. My soul is vexed when things don't go my way. My soul is vexed when the parking is skewed on Sunday morning. Like that's, that's how we live. And so we're not much different from Esau. And then we get to Jacob and Jacob, you could argue is worse because he's just as broken and just as messy and just as depraved as Esau, but he tries to cover it all up by good duties, by clean living. He's a deceiver. We see it again and again and again. He is not someone. Esau is not someone we want to invite to our child's birthday party. Neither is Jacob because he'd be stealing the toys and then blaming on Esau. Like that's, so this is the human condition. This is the world in which we live. I went to the uh, for the first time in seven years, I went to get my eyes checked. In case you're wondering, uh, I can't see your faces beyond like the third row, okay? And I haven't for years. And so I'm supposed to wear glasses, but I can't preach them. It's a whole story. I have problems. But um, so I went to the eye doctor this week and she sits me down and she does my eyes. It's never good when a doctor is like, oh my. You know, like you know, as they're like doing something, they're like, like we don't even have something for that. And, uh, and then she told me, hey, you have keratoconus, which I knew I had. It's like an oblong eyeball. And she's like, so you're not really, you can't be fitted for traditional contacts and you need glasses, but really you need to have some type of surgery done, especially on your right eye, because the stigma is growing and eventually you'll kind of lose vision in that eye. Even right now, you shouldn't go anywhere without glasses. Um, what do you do without glasses? I'm like, I, I don't know. I teach people and, and do all stuff all week long. And uh, she's like, you really shouldn't be doing that. And I just kind of, she's like, you need to schedule this appointment and this appointment and this appointment. And I just kind of walked out that day. Look, I'm a dude. I'll admit it. I'm probably like Esau. Esau would have never scheduled any appointments. I'm not scheduling any appointments. I'm like, if I go blind, God gave us two. And so, um, you know, this one won't work. And so that's just kind of how I am. I'm like, this is my plight. Like, this is what I'm stuck with. This is the world that I'm going to kind of live in. It suited me for 44 years. It will continue to suit me like I'll be okay. Some of us reach that point. Like the, the human race, and I would argue, especially Americans, we like to live in deniability. Not of the condition of others. That was another conversation I was having with the tattoo artist this week. Is they're like, man, we're not even, one of them, not even Christian Adam, and he's just talking about, man, we are so like forgiving of ourselves compared to other people. I'm like, bro, you're speaking my language. Like we can see the blight in everyone else, but we're, we're lacking self-awareness for ourselves. And then we come to, to a reality as, of self-awareness. We start to begin to see, maybe you have over the last few months, how broken I actually am. And then what happens? We accept the reality and almost embrace the reality. That's just how it's always going to be. And in some, in some respect, psychologically and Emotionally or mentally, that is how it's going to be. But something within our soul is transformed by the kindness of God's grace, and it doesn't always have to remain this way as it is. Which brings us to our second point this morning. You've got this shady guilt going on for all of them, but particularly Jacob, who we're studying. And then you've got, you guys know it, sovereign grace. 
Because Romans chapter 9, what does it say? As Paul is about to establish his arguments for the eternal kindness of God in his picking certain people to be the recipients of his eternal favor and grace, what does he say? He uses the story of Jacob and Esau. And he says, for the twins not yet being born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of election might stand, not of him who desires, mean us, but of him who calls, that's God. So basically, in, in, simply put, is this. You look at Esau, barbarian. You look at Jacob, deceiver. The reality is, is one of them is not better than the other, and yet one of them received complete pardon. Complete. And he, like Paul's argument is, hey, it's not because he was good. He hadn't done anything good or bad. It's because God is gracious. And that's what we understand here in the text as we read it. Uh, you have one son, he's all despising his birthright. There's all the spiritual ramifications of this, treating it as nothing. You have the other son trying to earn his birthright. Even though he knows at this point, he's close to his mom, he knows what God said, no doubt, to his mom earlier on when she was pregnant with them, that the, the younger will be, the patriarch will be preeminent. And yet he's still trying to earn what could only be his by grace. Uh, I was thinking this week back to when we adopted uh, Winnie. As some of you were, I was going to say Spurgeon or Augustine. Yes, we adopted our two sons. But before that time, uh, we were a dog family. And so we had a couple of chihuahuas and then a really, really ill-tempered shih tzu. And so we were like, hey, let's, let's try a fourth one. Yes, we were those people. And so we heard these Pomeranian pups had been born over in town and country area. And so we went up, I guess, north of town and country. It's a little more rural. We turned onto the street. And uh, it's normal Florida homes. And there's like this log cabin. I kid you not, like sitting there on the street. And that's where these Pomeranians are. And so we go inside and it was just kind of a mess. And all these pups are running around. They're all little black pups. Like they're a little black with like some white markings. And then there's this one little orange pup that looked like a tiny little Winnie the Pooh bear. I know, adorable. Um, God at that point in time makes them cuter. Okay, he just makes them cuter. He makes it so their breath doesn't reek at that point. No one, ado- look, that's why we're always like, oh, you adopted an older pup? Good for you, right? Because we're like, they deceive us. They're little deceivers themselves at that age. Like, you know, eight, 10 weeks old, we're like, oh, they're so adorable. Like, it doesn't, and then when they use the bathroom in the house and they chew up everything, we're like, my gosh, what have we done? They pulled the bait and switch on us. And so, um, but anyway, Winnie, we see her. I saw a picture. I didn't throw it up there this morning, but we saw a picture of Winnie. Uh, Daniel holding Winnie and like, this is just the most adorable dog ever. And so we decide to make her part of our family. Okay, point being this, that is how we see oftentimes spiritual adoption. I believe that, maybe not for other people because once again, we can look out and be like, oh my gosh, they're, they're a mess. But for me, I'm sweet. I mean, not me. I'm talking hypothetically here. Um, I'm sweet. I'm talented. I'm beautiful. I'm cool. I'm spiritual. I'm righteous. I've got a lot to offer. We're always trying to sell ourselves on other people. Why not do the same thing with God? Like, look at me. That's not why he adopts us. That's not why he takes us in. That's not why he, like, chose Jacob here to carry on the lineage. It's sovereign, undeserved, unforfeited, unmerited grace upon grace. Um, Brennan Manning said this, my trust in God, our trust in God should flow out of the experience of his loving me day in and day out, whether the day is stormy or fair, whether I'm sick or in good health, whether I'm in a state of grace or disgrace, he comes to me where I live and loves me as I am. Tim Chester went on to say this, writer for the Gospel Coalition, that's the scandal of grace. It means that if you've been working hard to be right with God, then you've been wasting your time because God welcomes everyone, righteous and unrighteous alike. Like this, this is a scandal of grace by faith in Christ. Or I heard it this way this week. I was reading and I had to smile. 
Uh, it's a little meme, but basically the background of the meme is this, that the Apostle Paul, if you're unfamiliar with him, he wrote at least 13 books in the New Testament, possibly 14. But before his conversion, he was a terrorist. And Acts tells us he literally, Acts chapters 8 and 9, was breathing out murder and slaughter against the church, men, women, and children. So in his lifetime, he sanctioned or even carried out himself the massacre of women and their children, barbarian. So, and then the meme went on to say this, something to the extent. Grace means scandalous. Unearned grace means that when the terrorist Paul entered heaven, those whom he had slaughtered stood up and cheered. But we can't even get over something bad someone said about us. Like that's, that's the scandal of grace, is that by, when, when Paul entered heaven, when Paul entered, people stood up and cheered, not because Paul had turned it around, but because people see, I would argue, people see on the other side what God sees on this side. And that is not our deception if we're in Christ, but by the scandal of grace through faith, he sees now and they see there the righteousness of Jesus Christ covering us, having been received completely undeserved, completely unearned. So, that's what we see here. Like, as a matter of fact, I'll just kind of close with this. Um, Isaac has these two sons. Esau, what's for them more? Jacob. Jacob's the deceiver. That's his name. But his name's changed to Israel. And his name doesn't mean deliverer, his name means God provides. So as we approach this series over the next seven weeks and we see deceiver, deliverer, those two statements, those two monikers are not about Jacob. The first is, and judge the post to all of his treachery and all of his deception and all of the sin that we see throughout the patriarchs in their history, we have a deliverer who's still working, who's still providing, who's still granting covering, and still pointing them forward and us back to the cross work of Christ that we need to be reminded of again and again and again. So it breathes life into us and begins to transform and change us. Not by guilt, not by obligation, not by manipulation, not by me staying up here this, this morning and telling you what you gotta do, but by God saying, this is what I have done for you. This is what I've done for you. Go and live in freedom. The freedom, as I often say, not to do whatever you want, the freedom to do what you want to do. Let's pray.